Okay, this sermon is entitled, An Instruction Manual for Anti-Grace Preaching. I'd like to open up with prayer, and then with a few verses. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 79 reads, O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints unto the beast of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. Now when it comes to anti-grace preaching, there is a certain method that you have to use. You can't just read the Bible at face value and quote it verbatim. There are lots of different ways you have to manipulate the scripture and twist verses out of context as well as make up your own doctrine. So I've come up with a list of different ways to teach anti-grace, and that's why this is entitled the Instruction Manual for Anti-Grace Preaching. Number one, you have to be unsaved. Now, if you're saved, you can't change that. And you can't preach anti-grace if you're saved, and I don't see why any saved person would want to. Anti-grace preaching is reserved for the unsaved who hate grace and want nothing to do with it. So if you're saved, just go ahead and turn this sermon off. It doesn't even apply to you. Number two, the second thing you need to do when preaching anti-grace is to avoid salvation verses with the word believe in it. In other words, stay out of the book of John. Don't quote John 3.16 or John 3.36 or John 5.24 or John 6.35. Your best bet is to make your zip code in James chapter 2. Number three, you need to make up your own rhetoric. Say things like, repent of your sins and make Christ the Lord of your life. Use unbiblical phraseology, verbiage, and locutions. Number four, just use snippets of verses out of context. For instance, turn over to Matthew chapter 7. Now it reads in verse 20, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Now without giving this verse any context, just throw that phrase out and claim that it means that you'll know a Christian by how they live. In other words, to be a Christian you have to bear fruit and it's all about your works. So don't bother to tell people that this has to do with the person's teachings and which gospel they're believing, just throw the phrase out, you'll know them by their fruits, and totally misapply it. Number five, use discipleship verses for salvation. Turn over to Luke chapter 9. Let's take a look at verse 23, and it reads, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now obviously this is a discipleship verse. But see, as a false prophet who's preaching anti-grace, you don't have to tell anyone that. You can tell them this is a salvation verse. You have to come after Christ. You have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross daily and follow him. Basically, you're putting the cart before the horse. You're making salvation costly instead of a free gift. And you're denying that there is discipleship. And this is your proof text for lordship damnation. Number six, you need to find verses that you can twist to make them imply that Christians don't really sin. Turn over to 1 John chapter 3. Now the reason why this is so important is because if people are not that sinful, then they don't need grace. And if Christians are not that sinful, then their works would actually count. So let's take a look at verse 9 of chapter 3. It reads, Whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Now, if you're preaching anti-grace, you have to be so stupid to not realize that there's a difference between the flesh and the spirit. And this verse is talking about the spirit. The spirit never sins. But see, you don't have to unveil this to anybody. If you're an anti-grace preacher, you can just claim that Christians don't sin when it's not talking about the flesh at all. And then finally, number seven, take a black permanent magic marker, perhaps a sharpie, and start blotting out verses that give Jesus Christ and God all the glory when it comes to salvation. Start with 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 31, then go back to Romans chapter 16 and verse 27. Blot those verses out, because in anti-grace theology, we don't give God all the glory. Turn back to Galatians chapter 6. Now this is a big verse that needs to be blotted out. Let's take a look at verse 14, and it reads, But God forbid, 
that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Go ahead and just mark that verse out. Because in anti-grace thought, we need to give man all the glory. We give Jesus no glory because we don't believe Jesus had any part in saving us. Remember, we're anti-grace. We're anti-easy believism. We don't believe that salvation is of the Lord. We believe salvation is of us. So that's all there is to it when it comes to anti-grace preaching. Basically, you're just avoiding verses in John. You're making up your own words, your own rhetoric. Just use snippets of verses out of context. Confuse discipleship with salvation. Find verses that say that man is not that sinful. And give God zero glory. And if you want to, just make sure you emphasize the fact that you're going to hell. And that if anyone listens to this foolish garbage, they're going to hell too. That's all I have. Let me go ahead and close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.